Okay, I'm gonna talk about the basic procedure on uh, how to go about drilling a new well. Uh, my name is Pablo Canales, like Dr. Samani mentioned. Uh, th these are the things we're gonna be covering. Uh, some of them Dr. Samani already mentioned in the first presentation, but I think it's better to overemphasize so you guys get the point. So uh, planning for the well, pre-planning, preliminary design, drilling the well, well development, well testing and monitoring, and preventive maintenance is what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, so planning for the well. Uh, first of all, you're gonna need, in New Mexico, you're gonna need a permit uh, from the Office of the State Engineer. Uh, then you're gonna be uh, looking for a driller and the drill will be responsible for the design and the construction of the well. And uh, there are many ways that a well can be cheapened. So uh, don't, don't select your driller just on, based on price alone. Uh, look around on what quality of pro, uh, uh, materials you're gonna be using. Uh, getting the best, the best possible well can uh, pay off for itself in yield efficiency and the life of the well. If the well is designed improperly or constructed poorly, it can lead to sand pumping, high fuel cost or energy cost in the case of it's electric. It can also lead to low yields, so you're not getting the amount of water you, you need, and it also reduces its life. So to obtain the most efficient irrigation well, uh, these are a few steps to follow. You need to pre-plan and if possible, uh, you should uh, drill a test hole and uh, that, that gives us some information of uh, what kind of material we're gonna encounter in the aquifer. Uh, you should uh, do the design. Well, not, not you, but you should get somebody that, that knows how to design the well. Uh, do the drilling and the construction. Develop it is very important. Very important. Uh, do testing, maintenance, and treating if needed. And uh, keep a good record of the performance of the well. So pre-planning. Uh, the first thing we need to consider are the aquifer characteristics. So somebody says, okay, I want a well and I want to pump uh, 500 gallons per minute. Uh, how deep does my well need to be? Well, first of all, we need to know how fast the water uh, travels through the aquifer in that region. Also, if the water quality, uh, if we want to avoid uh, uh, certain areas of poor quality, then we might have to case and go deeper or do something to it to to avoid the bad, the bad quality areas. Um, so okay, then we need to anticipate the well depth and the diameter, and that'll depend on how much we wanna pump. So if we wanna pump 20 gallons per minute, we need a small well. If we wanna pump 2,000 gallons per minute, we're gonna need a bigger diameter and a deeper well. So um, the other thing is, okay, we need to predetermine the, the length of the screen, the type, and the slot opening. We need to design the gravel pack and also see how we're going to develop it. And we'll, we'll talk about that. So uh, before you drill a well, shop, shop around. Try to learn as much as possible. Uh, ask neighbors, drillers, ask the office of the state engineer, look for literature, just Google it. Try to learn as much as possible. Uh, okay, and if, if you have the resources, test drilling is uh, recommended, so again, uh, we can get samples of the cuttings that come out of the hole and uh, help design a little bit better for, for where we want to place the screen and uh, determine the length of the screen, the slot opening, etc. Okay, so preliminary design again. Uh, get our aquifer characteristics, decide on diameter, uh, calculate the length of the screen and the depth, and des design the gravel pack. So aquifer characteristics, we can find information on uh, USGS and also from the Office of the State Engineer. So this is the same map uh, Dr. Smani uh, showed us. Uh, it's a map um, made by the USGS. So it gives us, you know, a general um, area, of, you know, it gives us lat and launch of, uh, of the valley here. And uh, we can see how fast or how good the hydraulic conductivity is in, in, this, in the subsurface. Also, uh, well, I have this set up in my Google Earth and my laptop, so I have a bunch of records of other wells, and, and so depending, like say, we get somebody in, and has a property there and wants to drill a well there, so we would look at the wells around it and see how they perform to kind of help us design the new well. 
So when you go to a driller and say, okay, I want a thousand gallon per minute well, and they say, okay, you're gonna be need this depth of, of well, it'll, it, it's not like that. It's not like, okay, if you need this, you'll go this deep. You actually, it'll, it'll actually vary depending on the region you're at. So the well diameter, um, like Dr. Samani said, we, you need to go two inches larger than the size of the pump. And this will depend on the desired pumping rate. So a small flow pump will be smaller in diameter versus a higher volume. Well, it's a bigger pump, obviously. And um, the screen, in some cases, can be tapered to a smaller size than the casing. So for example, I have a big farm and I want uh, 2,000 gallons per minute. So again, we're here. So the optimum size would be a 20 inch, but the minimum size would be 16 inch well. And that's what you most commonly see here in the valley is 16 inch wells. And uh, just a maximum discharge rates from that size of a well, so a 16 inch well, the maximum rate we could be getting out of it, well, the maximum recommended rate would be 2850 gallons per minute. Okay, the, how much screen do we need? Well, uh, we have to, well, what, what, we, what should be done or what I do is uh, cost analysis. So we look for the cheapest pumping uh, in the long run. So in 10, 20 years, uh, what's, what's my uh, cheapest pumping gonna be? So um, we design based on, 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 on price in the long run. Um, Again, it'll depend on how much we're pumping out and on the aquifer characteristics. And the screen is located on the bottom of the well or, or below the pumping water level. If uh, the casing length, the pumping level should be above the uppermost well screen. That means, uh, yeah, pretty much the, the casing is above the screen. Uh, if, if you get the, the pumping water level into the screen, you'll have cascading. So that's pretty much well, a cascade. So it'll drag the sand into, your, into the well through the screen. So you don't, you don't want that. Uh, it'll also create entrained air in the aquifer. So it'll reduce the, the yield that the aquifer can give out. It'll accelerate corrosion because you pretty much have oxygen and water present in your, skin, in your screen. So it'll corrode faster. And also, oops, what did I do? it'll uh, cause incrustation. And incrustation is just pretty much like a big, uh, well, a scale that forms on the screen and, a, and it plugs up your well. So those are things you wanna avoid. And so the, the actual well depth is just the length of the screen and your, the length of the casing. So this is just an example of uh, cost analysis um, and it'll, the shape of this graph will depend on customer to customer basis based on their irrigation scheduling. So if they're irrigating so many hours per month or so many days per month, um, it, the, the shape will change. But this is pretty much what we're looking at. Uh, the upper two, well this one is pumping with a diesel engine, 12 months per year. And I think it was four days, uh, four days a month and I can't remember how many hours. Well the thing is, if we see here, it's cheaper to go with more screen. So um, in the long run, it's cheaper to drill a, a deeper well that'll save us money and fuel. Uh, the, red, the red one is pumping eight months with diesel engine and the purple and, and the other lighter blue is uh, pumping with an electric motor, uh, with the same flow and the same, the same thing. So as you can see, if you can go electric three phase, it saves you a lot of money. So it, it's all, it almost costs you half in, in energy cost or in fuel costs if you can get three phase uh, current. That is cost per year. Cost per year, yeah. And uh, again, don't, don't uh, take th these numbers too much into, into perspective because it'll depend on your flow rate, your irrigation scheduling and all that stuff. But just as an illustrative purpose. Okay, so the general layout of a well, uh, it's pretty much we have the case portion on top, followed by a screen portion, and I like to put a stool where if some sand comes in, it can uh, stay there and not, not start plugging up our, our length, our screen over here. So again, we want to have our pump inside the casing. So like the word 
casing is, it should encase the pump. The pump should be up there uh, to avoid sand pumping. If, if you have your, the pump down here, it'll concentrate the suction in a small region. So it'll just drag that sand into the well. It'll create problems. It'll wear out your pump and it'll start filling up your, your well with sand. So if it starts filling up, then you have less entrance of water. So the water comes in faster. So it drags, drags in more sand. So it just creates like a vicious cycle. So it's like a black hole. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, it's just, uh, I guess, uh, harakiri, like uh, the Japanese say. Yeah. So, um, anyways, uh, uh, how, how do we determine how um, how good a well is? Uh, well, th this is uh, it's called the specific capacity. So it tells us the flow rate over the drawdown. The drawdown is is uh, how much the water level is going to drop in the well when we start pumping. So. Um, We'll measure it like uh, so many gallons per minute per foot of drop. And uh, some of the older wells or poorly designed wells have very low uh, specific capacity, but uh, we should be aiming for higher specific capacities. Um, so what's a good number for you? Uh, above 50 is good. Uh, we drilled one a couple of weeks ago. We were getting 60, was it 60 or 66 gallons per minute per foot of drop inside the well. So, I know one with two gallons per minute per foot. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and we were actually uh, testing one of our clients' uh, older wells and he had like 17 gallons per minute per foot. So, uh, anyways, uh, the next step would be the gravel pack. What is a gravel pack? Well, it stabilizes the formation and it prevents the finer material in the formation, so like sands and silts, from entering the, the well. It also increases the permeability around the well, so water can travel easier through gravel than through fine sands. Uh, if you see a well driller coming in with a three-quarter inch or an inch gravel pack, he doesn't know what the heck he's doing. <laughs> There's no way you can retain uh, fine sands with big gravel. So the gravel pack should be uh, sized properly. Uh, the next question would be, well, do we need a, a gravel pack? Well, uh, to, to actually determine that, we would need a sieve analysis of the formation. And sieve analysis is pretty much know the size of the formation. Um, so the sands or whatever not is up out here. Uh, well, here in, here in the, our valley, we know there's uh, fine sands present. So we're going to assume the gravel pack is required. And if we can't design the gravel pack ahead of time, then we're going to design for the worst case. The worst case being the finer sands. We don't want them to be going into our well and plugging it up. So um, again, it's best to be conservative and avoid sand pumping. And the controlling factor is the size of the gravel not so much the thickness so again if if you have somebody coming in with a three-quarter inch gravel that there's no way that sand is going to stay out again uh, but also uh, look out for uh, the thickness so so the well should be uh, larger than the casing or the screen so that the the driller can pour in the gravel pack if he only has an inch in there there's no way he can put in that gravel pack so he needs to have uh, two and a half or more inches, preferably three or, or four inches is a good, good uh, thickness for the gravel pack. Okay, the next thing we need to see is the, the screen slot opening. So there's a whole range of, uh, of sizes in, that, in the opening. Uh, okay, it should be small enough to retain the gravel pack. So the size of the slots uh, are based on the size of the gravel pack. It's determined by that. So the slots must be large enough to let the water flow freely into the well, but they should be small enough to prevent sand from coming in. Uh, okay, uh, how much open area do we need on the screen? Well, we want water to be coming in as slow as possible so that it doesn't drag sand into the well. If, tr if water is coming in very fast, it'll drag the sand right in. So we want the water to be coming in at 1.2 inches per second. So just slow, slow enough. And uh, the slower, the better. Uh, entrance velocity is lower than that. Uh, 
will resu result in uh, low friction losses through, through the screen. It'll minimize the rate of incrustation. It'll minimize the rate of corrosion in the screen. And it'll give the well a long life. So um, what, op what open area do we have on screens? Well, it depends on the type of the screen. And we already saw this, this, uh, these uh, pictures earlier. So the more open area, the better. And the open area is measured in square inches per foot of screen. Again, just going back to these figures, 235 square inches per foot of this type of screen versus what some well drillers use, 15 square inches per foot. So when you look at it, it's ridiculous when you're trying to compare this, the amount of open area this pipe has. And all, all these wells are 16 inch, by the way. So it's ridiculous when you're trying to compare how much open area this well has compared to this type of screen. So again, the continuous V wire wrapped is the best. It has the most open area. How much more expensive is that? Depends on the material. Like this one is stainless steel. So this one is going to be quite much more expensive than this. It's going to be at least three to four times more expensive than this because, you know, th this is nothing more that somebody buys a pipe and they torch it. So it's cheap. But in the long run, uh, this will have a... Uh, this will create problems and it'll have a less life than th something like this. But maybe if we're comparing uh, low carbon steel to low carbon steel, the, they're a little bit more competitive, but still it's, it's a little bit more expensive to get the good material. Now, I uh, just want to point out your attention to this. Look at, look at the width of those slots. They're quarter inch or three eighths of an inch. So just imagine the size of the gravel they have to use and uh, Try to picture the fine sands in the, and the aquifer. So it's, it's really hard to, to keep sand from coming into the well when you have such a big opening. Okay, so what material do we want to construct our well from? Well, we want to consider these factors. The water quality, the corrosion resistance of the material, and that, that'll, th there's two types of corrosions. There's chemical corrosion and electrochemical corrosion. I'll explain that a little bit. Uh, and if we uh, plan ahead for acid treatments, then uh, we might want to consider a better, uh, better material. And also, the deeper the well is, the, the, more, the more strength, the more, the more collapse strength it should have. And the other, well, I guess the driving factor in most cases is the cost what you guys are willing to pay for it. So um, the common materials are PVC. It's corrosion resistance, but it has a low collapse strength. Low carbon steel is what you see on most uh, ir big irrigation wells. It's not corrosion resistant. Uh, if we use galvanized screen, it can prolong the life of the screen compared to the low carbon steel. And stainless steel, well, it's just uh, the best of the best. So I uh, just have a little disclosure here. So for maximum well life, if, if, you're, if you're building a well for, for, the, for the most number of years of service, then the higher cost of the most corrosive resistant material is always justified. Uh, note here, because uh, you, you see some drillers or some guys using stainless steel screen and low carbon steel casing. Uh, that's not a good idea, <laughs> and uh, this is why it's combining different metals will cause electrochemical <coughs> corrosion. So material is removed from the metal with the lowest uh, electric potential. So that means that um, the low carbon steel material will start degrading, and uh, so so it, it just it just accelerates corrosion in the in the in the casing. So if, even though you're saving a little bit of money by putting in the low carbon steel casing. Um, and the in the well medium to long run it'll 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 fail because of that so if you're using a stainless steel screen go you stainless, stainless steel. steel the whole way yep exactly yeah the, the the other way is to use a dielectric connection but for large diameter wells they they, they don't make them and, and what it is it's an isolator but they only make it i think up to eight inch Diameter, so. But you still have a problem, even if you use it. Yeah.
Uh, yeah, so yeah, because yeah, the, the groundwater bridges the yeah. so the, the salts and the and the groundwater act as a conductor, so it's it still creates a it's like a short circuit. Imagine it that way. Like a bad situation. Exactly. So uh, the the other thing is torch cuts torch cut slots openings in low carbon steel. So any heat treatment to, to, to the steel will also accelerate electrochemical corrosion. So sometimes that's why you see those, uh, well those to begin with big slots, they either start going bigger because of that corrosion. When you have that, does that cause the uh, casing to collapse? Yep. Yep, it'll, it'll j the, the casing or the screen will just start going thinner, thinner until they can't resist the, the collapsing pressure from the earth around and it just closes in on you. So if you're lucky, you can get your pump out. If not, well, <laughs> that's $20,000 of pump uh, just buried there. So, uh, okay, the, the drilling, drilling the well. Okay. So drilling the well includes boring the correct size hole of, for the well. Like I said, it, the hole should be larger than the casing so that we can put in gravel pack around it. And it also includes setting the casing and the screen into the hole and placing the gravel pack. Uh, I'm going to discuss the most common methods used here in the lower Rio, lower Rio Grande Basin. And this is the most, uh, most uh, popular one, the mud rotary, followed by reverse rotary, cable tool, and uh, auger. So just quickly going through it. Mud rotary, uh, first uh, the, what we do is we, we make a mixture of... Uh, bentonite clay with water and that's that's what we use as our uh, drilling mud then it, it's injected through a hollow drilling pipe and it goes out through the drill bit and so the drill bit is you know loosening up all the cuttings and as they're loosened uh, they're carried up by the drilling fluid up to the surface where they discharge into a settling pit and uh, you know all the gravels and big uh, sand they settle out and so you pump back the clean mud back to the drilling pipe and so it's just a recycling process now uh the most common well it's common to see the the settling pits on most drillers uh what i have is a mud cleaning uh, machine so i don't make i don't need to make a such a big pit i just make a small pit to to put in a pump and i have a machine that'll recycle and clean the mud so I can, well, in essence, uh, put in a, a cleaner mud in the system and uh, drill faster. Okay, so that's uh, mud rotary. That's what most guys use here in the valley. Reverse circulation is pretty much the same as mud rotary. The only thing, as you can see here, as, uh, as the arrows point out, the flow of the, mud, of the mud is backwards. So you're actually sucking through the drill pipe and the cuttings come out through there. And uh, the, again, the, the cuttings settle out in the pit and the clean mud is, is uh, poured back into the hole by gravity. So pretty much uh, it's the same thing, but, but the cuttings are sucked in through the pipe instead of flowing out through the hole. Those first two techniques, how can you tell what kind of material you're drilling through? Okay, if yeah. It's clay or gravel or sand. Well, w well, you actually have to put in your hand in the mud coming out of the hole, and uh, and you can um, you can uh, let's see if that works. Does that? Where's the out of zoom? Out of focus. Does that work? Yeah, well, kind of. So, so you actually have to take cu uh, cutting samples, and because uh, we actually the driller actually has to report what's coming out of the hole. So, from uh, for, well, like for example here, uh, we went from uh, from 80 to 100 feet. We got gravel with fine sands and and some clay. So we we need to report all this uh, to the office of the state engineer. And that, that's another useful thing we can, we can uh, look, up, look up when uh, we're trying to drill a, a well in your place. We can, we can try to find well logs of your neighbors to try to determine uh, what kind of material we'll encounter in the hole. So that's uh, what we do there. Let's see, let's keep going. Okay, uh, any question on this reverse circulation? 
The next uh, method, uh, you don't see it as much, but it's, um, it's also used in some places. So uh, what it is, it's, uh, it's a bit, it's a, just a heavy bit uh, that is hung by a cable and it's raised up and down. So it, it, it pretty much uh, crushes or it chisels through the, through the formation. Once the formation is kind of loose, they take the drill out, the, the drill bit out, and they put in a, a, what they call a baler. So it's pretty much a pipe that'll take the cuttings out. So first step, loosen up the material. Second step, take the, the loose material out. Third step, they, t they need to take the, the baler out and they need to hammer the casing in as the hole progresses. Uh, because this, um, yeah, there's, there's nothing to hold the hole open on this, this type of uh, drilling. On the other previous methods, the, the weight of the mud is what keeps the hole open. So uh, the hole should be maintained full. Uh, if, if it's left for too long, it'll collapse and it'll need to be reflushed. So let's see, okay, the, the fourth method, uh, the, and this is the fourth uh, least common method is uh, auger so it's pretty much just like a like a if you imagine it like a, a yeah a bit so so they drill a little bit and they trip out the bit and they they empty the cuttings out and they go in a little bit and on this method they also need to be uh, advancing the casing as they progress otherwise the hole would would close in on them as well oh the, Th this this uh, drilling method can only go to about a hundred feet, so only for shallow wells. So that's why. Uh, for monitoring wells, yeah. The thing is, it's really fast for for shallow wells because you you almost don't take any time setting up. But uh, what you most commonly see here in the valley, and and if you guys get a drill done, uh, this would be the the most common uh, method they would use the mud rotary. Now the thing is, remember I said the, the, the drilling mud is composed of bentonite clay. So just remember we, we put in clay into the hole to keep it open. Now we need to take that, that clay out, otherwise we'll have a reduced uh, uh, capacity. So after the, the, um, we drill the well and we put in the casing and the screen, we need to develop it. What does development mean? Clean it. Cleaning. So it means to clean out the drilling mud, the clays, and the fine sands from the aquifer formation around the well. And developing will improve the performance and reduce sump pumping of almost any well. Uh, failure to develop the well may reduce its potential yield to 50% or more. And this is just because it's clay and we put in there. So if we don't take it out, it's just like having a, a big clay pot in there and water can't get through it. Uh, very good. So. The purpose of developing is repair the damage done by the formation during well construction, increase the permeability, and stabilize the formation around the screen. And stabilize just means that we don't have any gaps uh, left in there. So we wanna make, every, make all the gravel pack uh, be in place and not have any big gaps. Um, the, the driller should be doing the developing and it should be done as soon as possible after the construction is completed. And uh, uh, keep an eye out for this. Your pump should not be used, not be used for the developing process. If they do, uh, there's a lot of sand content in that drilling mud. It will seriously wear out your impellers. So if you're putting in a brand new $4,000 pump, you're already damaging it if, if you use it to develop. So do not, do not have them use, use it for the developing process. Do you remove the uh, clay before or after you put in the gravel? Oh, no, we remove it after, after we put in the, the gravel pack. So, yeah, so, so we drill the hole, we lower in the, the casing and the screen, then we gravel pack it, and then we clean out the, clean out the clay, the drilling mud. How do you get the clay through the thing so you can pump it out? What do you mean? How do you get the clay through the gravel and the screen? So you can pump it out. It, it'll flow right in. It's it's a fluid, so it's it's and just thicker. It's okay. just thicker than water, so so it'll flow through the gravel pack into the screen and up through the well. So you use air pumping, basically. Yeah, yeah. and uh, we'll we'll see that. So uh, the common developing methods used 
and this is from least effective to most effective uh, and th this is what you most commonly see over pumping is one of them backwashing or raw hiding uh, surging airlifting and uh, that can surge and pump as well and uh, double double packer airlifting and the most efficient high velocity jetting we'll go through those briefly okay over pumping is nothing more than putting in a pump and just pumping the well at a higher capacity than it's designed for. So if we have a thousand gallon per minute well, we put in, we pump out two thousand gallons per minute, and hope hope for the best. Um, and the the thought behind it is that if it can pump sand free for two thousand, then it can pump sand free for a thousand. Not necessarily true, because over pumping just uh, creates flow inwards to into the screen. So we have the sand it bridges uh, the, the well the material around the screen bridges so we still have gaps in there so as 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 we turn on and off our pump it'll create that back and forth motion so these these gaps will collapse and we'll have a uh, sand pump sand pumping into our well so this is an easy method but it's not as effective uh, okay again if if they use your pump they're going to cause excessive wear to it and it'll reduce it, the efficiency of your pump. So if they do this method, don't, don't let them use your pump. Pay for it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, backwashing and raw hiding. Uh, it's uh, the same thing, just two different names for it. And it's nothing more than uh, starting uh, and turning off your pump. So that creates a little bit more of a back and forth motion. So as you start the pump, the water uh, the, the water and the, and the well goes down and if when you shut it off the water and the pump column comes back so it creates that flush so it, the idea is just to turn and turn it off and have that back and forth motion and trying to get trying to get those gaps out of there so that we have uh, less sand pumping there it's uh, not as efficient in long screens because it just uh, concentrates uh, the force in the upper part of the screen again uh, don't let them use your pump Surging, okay, surging is nothing more than like a piston in a car. So uh, it's like, it's a packer and it has uh, some uh, rubber gaskets or leather gaskets and it's moved up and down the casing or the screen. So it creates that in and outward motion, motion of, the, of the water through the screen so that we can stabilize that material um, and um, not not have as much sand sun, sand pumping so um okay so that back and forth moment movement is done it's taken out and then the, the sand that came in is taken out and uh, again if it usually only concentrates its effectiveness in the upper part of the screen and yep air lifting surging and pumping so this is done with an air compressor and uh, uh, the air pipe is lowered into the well and pumped at a constant volume. And so we have uh, wa the water or the drilling mud coming out with the sands. And so that way it doesn't create any wear on any pump because there isn't no pump. The water is just lifting the water up. And so we do that until the water comes out clear. Then we, then we close in the, the air supply let the, the let the pressure build up in the compressor then we suddenly open the valve and that uh, high uh, surge of air will come into the well it'll push initially it'll push the water into the well creating that outward motion but as that uh, water bursts up into the surface the water will come in so again it, we want that in and out motion to um, to get an effective development and it, uh, it, it'll bring out the drilling mud and it'll bring out uh, the sand as well uh, and it should be done at different heights uh, along the the casing and the screen so we can clean the whole length of the of the well um, yeah so and it's continued until we have relatively no sand coming out okay this method is the same as uh, the previous one it's just it just concentrates its effectiveness in a smaller area so it's more efficient so uh, you can see it has a 
it seals off up here and down here so it concentrates that inward and outward motion in just a small area so we can clean it real good before we move on to the next section so again that that uses uh, uh, air pu air pumping to pump that out and then surging it to create that burst and make that outward inward uh, motion um, it's a lot more effective because we can uh, localize the the force into specific points in the screen high velocity jetting is the most efficient method and it is often the most costly uh, and it's nothing more than just having a, a, a jet of water uh, going into and washing the gravel pack and the formation around the screen. So just, it's just like having a garden hose and really concentrating it in a place. It'll wash out all that, that, that gravel. It'll loosen up the, ma the mud and we'll be able to take it out. And it also helps the, the gravel pack arrange itself in the most... Uh, compact way so that it doesn't let the, the sand to come in in the future. Okay, um, yeah, we move it up and down the, the formation and it is uh, very effective because again we can concentrate the force in a small area so we can we can treat the whole screen length. Uh, okay, what else? Okay, now the other thing is even though it's the most effective uh, method uh, its effectiveness will be limited by the type of screen we use. So that's another nice thing about the continuous slot screen. Uh, you can see when we're jetting it, we can really access all that gravel pack and that formation and really clean it real good. If we have other types of screen like, like this slotted one, well, it's going to be hard to aim that, that little slot in the screen, so it's not going to be as effective. Same thing with the louvered or the other type. So. Even though it's the best method, it'll, it, it'll work great with, when you have this type of screen. Okay, so again, which one is the best? So uh, each one has a different uh, efficiency. Uh, some of them are better to remove the drilling fluid because they concentrate the, the, their force into a certain region. And so what else? Uh, we want to create a high porosity or high conductivity around the, well the, the around the screen. So just comparing these ones, if we just over pump, just imagine, uh, well this is a specific capacity. So if we just over pumped our new well, we would get 7.8 gallons per minute per foot. If we did, air, if we followed that by air surging, we would get 12 gallons per minute per foot. If we did jetting, we would be getting 14. So just by doing a good developing, we can uh, well pretty much almost double the double the yield of the well. You can see from seven to fourteen. So a good developing process will will make for a better well. You don't develop. I mean, you don't combine those techniques. You just put. Well, no, actually, actually, well, what I do in my personal case is I do the air surging and air pumping. After after it comes out pretty clear, I put in the jetting. And then, well, and that's another thing I should have. It's basically for both, right? Yeah, I have an equipment for both. Yeah, my, my drilling rig has a 1,070 cubic feet per minute air compressor at 400 PSI, so I can clean pretty much whatever whatever I wanted to with the. Uh, yeah, let me see if, uh, I don't know if, uh, let's see if that works. Oops. Yeah, so, okay. So yeah, so, so th this is what we get uh, after the first jetting. So you can see there's a lot of clay of the drilling mud that came out and a lot of sand initially. Th and that's from one well. This, was, this is from another well. Again, we have a clay layer and a lot of sand coming out. That's the first pass. As we keep going, the fifth pass, we almost don't have much clay and just a little sand. And we keep on going until the water is crystal clear. Well until the sand content is reasonable. Um, okay. Okay, what else? Okay, uh, just comparing, uh, th there's different types of drilling mud, just uh, going with the, well, anyways, I'll just skip through that. Uh, well testing, uh, it's important to determine the actual performance of the well. So the specific capacity, how many gallons per minute per foot it'll, it'll yield. 
and so we can determine the correct pump size and, uh, power and uh, size the, the power unit appropriately. So here's an example. Uh, here are two different wells. How's, that's how they, they uh, perform with different uh, pumping rates. And these over here are uh, pump characteristic curves. So that's how uh, different pumps perform at different flow rates. So we could choose these pumps over here or we could choose these pumps over here depending on, on how much uh, we would want to pump there. So you pick the, you select the pump after you've completed the well? That, that would be the recommended uh, way about going it. Unfortunately, it's not always the case. So sometimes we kind of get ahead of ourselves and try to have the pump there. So, but in theory, this, this is the be best practice. Um, yeah, because it, it can really help us determine the select the pump with the highest efficiency for our system. Uh, well testing, okay, uh, well testing is achieved by monitoring the flow rate and the level, the water level inside the, the well as it is pumped. Uh, just different types of pumps for bigger wells. We have, we can have one of two, the submersible turbines, which is just the, the motor is submerged in water and uh, the pump is above it. It's cheaper than, than the, the regular turbine. It's easier installation and pretty much once it's in, you don't maintenance, you, you don't do any maintenance on it unless it, it fails for some reason. What puts the normal life on those? Well, uh, really it's, if the motor has proper cooling on it, it should last 20, 30 years. And uh, well, the impeller's life will be dependent on whether the well is sand free or not. If, if, if you're pumping a lot of sand, then you'll wear out your impellers and you'll need to pull it out and replace it. Now the turbine pine is, uh, the turbine pine, turbine pot, it's pump, here we go. <laughs> it's a little bit more expensive. It, it, the installation is a little bit more uh, complicated and you need to maintain it and you need to perform maintenance on it, especially if, if it's an oil lubricated pump. So you'll see a little uh, container where, where you put in the oil to lubricate the bearings on it. And if it's uh, driven by an engine, well, you, need, you also need to maintain the engine and the gearhead. And uh, on the other hand, if it's electric, then it's easy, it's easy to maintain and, and access the electric motor because it's just above. Um, how do we select the, the pump? We test the well, establish the characteristics. Okay. Uh, let me see. Well, I guess. Do you guys have any questions? You were you were saying that uh, to use the the wire type uh, screen. Yep. What about if you if we already have the what you call the cheap pipe, which is not cheap at all, but that is less expensive than the steel type. Would you still put the uh, stainless steel screen, or just go with the uh, same type of material on the screen. So if you already have the, what I understand, you already have a well in mm -hmm. place and you want to make it deeper? Or? Well, uh, we're, we're deeper in some wells. Uh -huh. We want to change the, uh, the screen type on it. Obviously it's not the... the right yeah, I, I would just go with, uh, with either keeping, staying with the low carbon steeler or maybe go, just oh, going up to the galvanized. All right, so it's not going to prolong the life of the screen just by doing... <laughs> no, it, 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 well, the, the screen will be there long, but if, if you mix the materials, it'll, it'll corrode your casing a lot faster, so the well will close up above, even though the screen is still good. All right. You know what I mean? Yeah, and the other question is, where do you get the, uh, the best gravel pack material you use around here? Well, you have to look around for it. <laughs> That's a... Uh, yeah, <laughs> company. Easy to find, easy to find. Yeah, company can provide some travel, travel around it. Yeah, so, so, some local uh, uh, ma bank materials have, have it. Uh, others, others are... Yeah, Johnson normally has good damage, it's expensive. Yeah. Yeah, and well, just a just, uh, brief maintenance, just uh, as a recommendation for you guys with the wells. Okay. Well, in your earlier presentation, you said the well diameter, two sizes larger than the 
Okay, so like for example, for, uh, for 2,000 gallon per minute uh, flow rate, the, the size of the, of the pump, the outer diameter is like 14 inches. So 14 inches plus two, 16 inch well. So that's, that's, that just gives us enough room to, to put in the pump in the well. If, if, it, if it's any less than that, it's too tight and we might get stuck in there. So at least two inches larger than the pump. The, the discharge pipe coming out can be different size. So. Uh, that is also used, but uh, I think copper prices are even higher than steel. So. Well, you think it's good for corrosion resistance? Yeah, it, it, it's it's been used in. in I'm sorry. As good as galvanized. Jeez, I wouldn't be. Yeah. You know. They have. Uh, How do you determine yeah. the amount of chlorine for chlorination? Uh, it'll be based on the on the well, you know. So if it. Let's let's get the next company done, and then probably will be here for all kinds of questions. Keep going. Yeah, I have questions there. Thank you. The preceding was a production of New Mexico State University. The views and opinions in this program are those of the author and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the NMSU Board of Regents.